Hey, I'm Miriam. I am honoured to be with you this morning and share with you the words um, that God would have us hear. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away, sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With, this, with, sorry, with man this is impossible but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields and with them persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. In these words, we hear the word of the Lord. Do any of you enjoy watching Netflix? I've been watching this show called Fire Company, Fire Country. And there are two... They're almost like brothers, but they're not. They're friends, but they've kind of been raised together. And one of the brothers' mum actually needs a kidney transplant. And so they've all gone to go get tested. Now, the biological son happens to be on a community program exiting out of prison, but he's still got a bit of time to serve. The friend is a firefighter, and they both fight fires. And the son is saying to the friend, it's my mother, I need to do this for her, I need to give the kidney. And the friend is, that will mean you go back to prison, that will mean all these other things. And he's saying, don't take this away from me. And then off they go to fight this fire. So in the drama, there's always things going on. But then they go to fight this fire where there's some protesters, protesters, protesting against a forest being destroyed for more buildings. And one of the people ends up tying themselves to a tree, as good protesters do. And they've got to rescue this person out of this tree before the fire comes. That meant that they couldn't protect the trees because they're protecting the people. The sun came up with an idea to wrap the fire blankets around the trees to help this person who'd gone to the trouble of protesting, unable to do the thing of protect the trees. And as they were leaving, she says to him, thank you so much for doing that. And he's like, I'm sorry you couldn't get the credit. And she said, I don't need the credit. I'm just grateful the trees were saved. And then he learned something from that. And he took that back into his own situation, went back to his friend and said, you know what, I was making this kidney donation about me, 
when it's not actually about me. It's about helping my mother. So if you can do it, you do it, because this is going to help my mother more. I wonder how many times in our helping we are doing it for ourselves and we've lost sight of the bigger picture. Today's story invites us to learn a little more about ourselves. As we consider our Lord's encounter with the man with many possessions, we can imagine Jesus' insight into his heart and soul. He had followed the specific outward regulations that were spelled out, those Ten Commandments, all those rules and regulations. But Jesus perceived in him something that still blocked him from having that total connection to God, that total obedience. And for that man, it happened to be his many possessions. Material belongings stood in the way of following Christ because having heard Jesus' opinion that he needed to give them up, he went away shocked and grieving and stunned and defeated and perhaps even broken-hearted. He could not meet the ultimate measure of obedience to God. His love of possessions had blocked him from totally loving God and following Christ. Those of you who were here two weeks ago, we heard the story of King David, whom everyone loved, right? King David is high up there on our pedestal of people to follow. And yet we heard in those stories all the good, the ugly, and everything that makes King David King David. Everything belongs in that story. It is good to know the whole story. And I'm assuming, because I wasn't here, last week you were listening to the story of Job and the way that his friends related to Job. And they tried their best but actually probably made a good mess of it. And Job teaches us something about dualistic thinking, that it's not God's thinking. Everything belongs to God. It's not, I do this, then I get that. It's not, don't do this and then do that. Everything fits. Everything belongs. Romans 8 reminds us that nothing can separate us from God's love. Height, depth, east, west, I don't know my directions too well. But all of the things, nothing separates us from God's love. There are so many stories in the Bible highlighting that way of thinking. Are you in or are you out? Are you welcome at the table or are you not? Are you a tax collector or are you not? Are you rich or are you poor? Our dualistic way of thinking gets us into trouble sometimes. And in today's story, it's interesting to note that Jesus' initial response to what must I do to inherit eternal life is also quite interesting. Referring to the Ten Commandments, he offered a list of what the man had to do to qualify. But when the man had many possessions, testified to his lifelong practice of following all those commandments, Jesus doesn't say, oh, well done, good and faithful servant, keep trying. He actually gives him a little poke, <laughs> nudges him along a little, provokes him to think outside that box, to think outside of following the rules. Interesting, the man says, what must I do to inherit? Not what can I do how can I be, how can I further my connection with God? And hopefully you've connected the two stories. But the beginning of that sentence, Jesus says, with love for him, he says, you lack one thing. It is with love that he provokes him. It is with love that he challenges him to grow. How many times have you grown when it's been coasting along and you've been having a fabulous time? How many times have you grown 
when it's felt like a bit of a poke in the side. Let's look at what does actually eternal life mean? It's not life until the end of time. It's about quantity, but quality. Eternal life means in a deep connection with the ageless, invincible values of the kingdom of God. Eternal life describes the quality of relationship between human beings and Christ, bringing us to the present knowledge and experiencing the loving and living spirit of God. Richard Rohr is a theologian. He happens to be Catholic. Don't hold that against me. But he's a great theologian and he's got his latest book is Everything Belongs. And in that he claims that we tend to live on the boundaries of our own lives, confusing the edges with essence and superficial with substance. The path of prayer and love and the path of suffering are, as he suggests, the two great paths to the centre, the centre of connection with God. Suffering gets our attention while love and prayer get our heart and our passions. And together they are the root of spiritual transformation. Deep connection with God is what we are striving for, to continue to transform who we are spiritually. And I hope that's why you're here at church, other than the good coffee and the morning tea and the great friendship. But how do we transform who we are so we can be more Christ followers, Christ disciples? What does it mean to be on a path to the centre? Richard Raw suggests a gradual awaking, a discovery that I am not and can never be in control. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. In control. Most of us want to be in control. And we want to do something. And we should do things. But really... Growing in our faith comes down to seeing, having your eyes open. It involves learning to see, something that is always at the heart of genuine spiritual journey. It also involves acceptance of reality and choosing to live fully and accept our reality. Sounds pretty simple, right? The simplest things are sometimes the most profound and difficult things to do. If prayer is not enticing you outside your comfort zones, if Christ is not an occasional threat, you probably need to do some growing up and learning to love. Is that not what Jesus is doing in this story? He's Challenging this boy. The man with many possessions testified to his lifelong practice of following the commandments. And Jesus sought to provoke him. He provokes in us this whole new level of understanding about eternal life in God. Raw describes people who live from the centre as those who know what boundaries are worth maintaining and which ones can be surrendered. In contrast, those who live at the circumference defend every ego boundary and are frankly quite difficult to live with. He describes that the way to the centre is to see that in and through God everything belongs. We had that in our psalm, the earth and the whole world, everything we belong. It has been said by not necessarily a theologian that we humans are very good at creating divisions, often where there are none, 
between classes and culture, between our all different denominations, our different religious traditions. We would, you know, separate us out by our hair or our eye colour if we could. How is it that if all religions say there is one God, why wouldn't we expect it to be the same message and just come from different faces? Would it not be that same message of compassion, kindness and love? That the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So what does it mean to truly know that everything belongs, the good, the bad, the ugly, the joyful and the painful? Richard Raw says, if we can learn to trust God, the next movement of our soul is to trust ourselves. Jesus tells us in the Gospels, don't be afraid. He's saying you can trust yourself because God trusts you. Using your journey, your experience, nothing is wasted. All is forgiven. Nothing will be used against you. In fact, I will even use your sins to transform you. If that be the case, then suddenly everything is safe in the universe. Everything belongs. God uses everything for our transformation. There are no dead ends. There are no wrong turns. There's no wasted energy. Everything is recycled. Sin history and salvation history are two sides of one coin. Jesus sought to provoke him and he provokes in us a whole new level of understanding about eternal life. Just those couple of words at the beginning of the sentence reminds us, with love for him, the Lord said, Trusting God comes in loving God, following from that loving ourselves and transformation is possible when we are connected to God's infinite love. Jesus calls us to have faith like a child. Others might use a phrase like a beginner's mind in order to continue to grow in faith and continue to process of transformation, our spiritual selves, our eyes, our eyes need to be opened. Some people like to use that glass half empty, half full. If we're in control and we know it all, how can we grow? We need to be childlike, curious, not know it, have a beginner's mind. The past few months for me, have challenged my need to control and I found myself finding strength in being vulnerable, allowing God to sit in the driver's seat and do my best to make my ego take a back seat. I suspect that Jesus was responding to the rich man's needs to be in control, to earn his way into God's kingdom. It cannot be earned, as we know. One has to be invited. And in order to receive that invitation, one needs to be open and curious like a child. Recently, I found my own experience of pain and turmoil that we are not too great at actually loving ourselves and staying connected to the source of all love. As someone who spent a lot of time preaching and talking to people, I was always really good at the love your neighbour as yourself commandment, right? That's what we do. And the church in all of its history has been very good at kind of focusing on the neighbour. And I would help people to focus on themselves. But I kind of forgot the bit that goes before. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. What's that about? Stay connected 
Love God with your whole being. When you do that, the second part just flows on. To self, then to neighbour. Very hard to do that if you're not connected to the source of all love, if you're not connected to the breath of all life. How can we know that love to the very core of our being? I want to conclude with a poem about love by John O'Donoghue. When love wakens in your life, in the night of your heart, it is like a dawn breaking within you. Where before there was anonymity, now there is intimacy. Where before there was fear, now there is courage. Where before in your life there was awkwardness, now there is a rhythm of grace and gracefulness. Where before you used to be jagged, now you are elegant and in the rhythm with yourself. When love awakens in your life, it is like a rebirth, a new beginning. Love allows understanding to dawn and understanding is precious. Where you are understood, you are at home, free to release yourself. into the trust and shelter of another person's soul. Following the way of Jesus is following the way of love. Having faith takes courage, trust, and all is possible when we are connected and know that everything belongs. Amen.